Hey, Seth, say happy Mother's Day. We love you. Thank you for everything you do. Yay! Say, umma. Umma. Hey, guys, happy Mother's Day. I'm sorry that uh, this Mother's Day is going to be a little more challenging than other years, but we're so thankful for you for always putting uh, others' needs before yourselves. Uh, we just wanted to wish you a happy Mother's Day, and we love you. Happy Mother's Mother? Day. Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mom. We love you. Yay! Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. I love you, Mommy, and you're the best mommy in the universe. I love Mommy. Happy Mother's Day. We hope you have a good Mother's Day. I love you. Sunday. We have cards for you. And I think we will, you will like it. <laughs> Pressure is on. I love I you. We'll get you big time. Nice. We love you. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. I like when you cook for me. Happy Mother's Day, Emma. And I love you. Hugging me. Thank you. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan, say happy Mother's Day. Good job. I love you, Mommy. <laughs> happy Mother's Day. Thank you for helping us with all of our work. Thank you for pushing us to try harder. Thank you for helping me warm, warm. Thank you for folding all the laundry. You are the best. We, we love, love you. you. Happy Mother's Day. I love my mom because she's kind, caring, and teaches me how to follow Christ. I love you, Emma. Good morning and welcome to All Nations Online. My name is David. I serve on the pastoral team. Uh, we're glad that you're able to join us for worship today. Uh, before we begin our time of worship, each and every Sunday, we start with the call to worship, uh, where we look into God's word to remind ourselves of who he is and what he has done for us. Uh, especially during this time of crisis and confusion, we can forget who God is and in turn forget who we are in him. And that is why we look to scripture uh, to remind us of who he is and who we are. Uh, the call to worship comes to us today from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praises. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for you, they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Amen. Church, God is fulfilling his purpose in this world and for us personally. We may not know what this exactly is, but his word tells us so. So let's look to him and humbly cling to his promises at this time. Let's pray together before we begin our time of praise.
dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it the storm inside of me let it rise
Amen. I know that song might have been difficult for some of us to sing uh, because we may not be sensing or experiencing the goodness of God in our lives these days. You know, seasons of suffering uh, can bring opportunities uh, to sin and rebel against our God. Whether it's falling into temptation, failing to trust in Him, or completely ignoring Him, uh, we are prone uh, to sin more in these times. Uh, but the amazing truth is that our God, even in the midst of our shortcomings, asks us to draw near to Him and confess those sins. And when we do, we know that God is faithful and He is good to forgive us of our sins. To lead us in this time of confessing our sins, let's read together in one voice Proverbs 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Church, God's mercy is abundant for us. He invites us to draw near and to honestly and openly confess our sins. Let's pray at this time. Church, now receive the assurance of pardon that comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy with this amazing reminder that we are God's people. Let's celebrate uh, his grace by singing the song of renewal together.
Rest in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Let's lift this up together. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Dear God, we come together again this week for worship from our current lives that still seem so different, but are slowly becoming our new normal. We thank you for another week of enduring our individual hardships, celebrating our small victories, and the opportunity to encourage one another during this time. Today, we celebrate and thank you for our mothers. We thank you for the special people who have had the role of bringing us into this world, for loving and guiding us, and for being our number one supporters through every moment of our lives. We are so blessed by our mothers during this season who are taking care of their children in a new and different environment with such strength. We pray that our mothers will continue to be blessed as much as they bless us. With this, we would like to pray for the new mothers within our community. May they have the physical strength to raise their children and that they will have peace with the emotional changes that come with motherhood. We would also like to pray for those who are missing their mothers more than ever today. We pray for healing and that you soothe their hearts. May you fill the hearts of those who are feeling the absence of a motherly figure in their lives. Lord, we are so grateful for our mothers, who we can all wholeheartedly agree are one of the most patient people in our lives. If we have strained relationships or even small conflicts that we have had with our mothers, may we open up our hearts to reach out to them. Give us the conviction and grace to put aside our pride to love our mothers, as we are all imperfect people striving to be more like you. Father, we also lift up to you the women in our vicinity who are going through or have had the struggle in the journey of becoming a mother. We pray for healing for their aching and grieving hearts. May you bring healing and perseverance into their hearts, and we as a congregation want to stand with them and want to continue to support them through this time. We pray in faith for blessings and strength. Lastly, we continue to pray for the situation of COVID-19. We lift up those who are ill and the frontline workers who are consistently supporting us through this pandemic. We pray for recovery and health for them as they bravely serve us in hospitals, markets, and essential locations. May we continue to have trust in your plan for us, that we may not shy away from opportunities to share your love to those around us in our community. May we have the diligence and faith to continue to push forward in this season, and may we look back on this time and remember your constant faithfulness. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, and thank you so much for joining us again online, especially on this Mother's Day. I hope that we would all take time uh, to remember to thank and express genuine love uh, towards the mothers in our lives. And uh, it's such an important holiday. And so to all the men and the children watching, today is very, very important. Uh, husbands, you might be able to get away with the every day is Valentine's Day line and, and slack on February 14th, uh, but that line does not work on Mother's Day, okay? Today is very important, trust me. Uh, I know from a painful and failed experience uh, that it's really important uh, to remember, to honor, and to express love uh, towards our mothers. Well, today is the second week of our series on the parable, parables, and uh, we're going to be looking at one of Jesus' most famous and popular parables, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, everyone loves a good redemption story, whether it's Simba from The Lion King, uh, Bruce Wayne, The Dark Knight, uh, Jon Snow from, well, if you know, you know. And uh, we just gravitate towards those stories uh, where a character loses everything, hits rock bottom, and then fights his or her way back up to the top. And I think one of the reasons why we're attracted to these stories is because they give us hope that something like that can happen to us. We want to be reminded, actually, we need to be reminded, that no matter how bad things get, 
that no matter, matter how low we go, that things can always turn around. We need to remember and be reminded that, that redemption is always on the horizon. And in Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives the ultimate redemption story by telling the parable of the prodigal son. If you're familiar with the story, there are three key characters. There's two sons and one father. And the youngest son is the the character we normally kind of key in and focus in on the most. He is someone who has fallen away tremendously. And then he's graciously, lovingly restored. Other times we may key in on the older brother and maybe even find ourselves identifying with the older brother who is always responsible uh, towards his father, always putting the family first and yet struggling with a heart that's critical, a heart that's prideful, a heart that's judgmental. But what's really powerful and what's really significant about the parable of the prodigal son, it's, it's not the story of the two sons. It's actually the character of the father and the father's heart towards his two lost sons. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to our passage today. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. And because the passage is a bit longer, I'm going to actually read uh, the passage in two parts. And so we'll just be reading the first half of the passage now, and then we'll pick up the rest later. The words are going to go up on the screen to my right, right here. And so trusting that you are there, may God bless the reading of his holy and matchless word. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Amen. The word of the Lord. Now, in preparing this message, on top of reading some commentaries and books on the prodigal son, I reread a sermon given by the late Edmund Clowney, a former professor of Westminster uh, Theological Seminary. And he gave a, a sermon on the prodigal son titled, Sharing the Father's Welcome. And it's one of the greatest messages I've ever heard or read on this parable. Tim Keller actually credits this sermon as the impetus and inspiration for his book, The Prodigal God. And I want to let you know that uh, this message was so rich and impacting for me that I want to share uh, some of its main points with you today. Uh, it's available online, and so if you want to look it up and, and uh, yeah, just get a, get a better version of, of, of this sermon, uh, you can look it up. It's called Sharing the Father's Welcome. The first thing I want us to see today, though, from this parable is the father's heart towards a reckless son. The father's heart towards a reckless son. The story begins with a man who had two sons, and from the start, Jesus breaks custom. He breaks custom by describing the younger before the older. Okay, I'm an older son in my family. My name always comes first, but now I haven't lived in Atlanta for 19 years, and so every time I go back home, I am referred to as my brother's brother, right? And that's, that's such a little 
slight into my ribs, but I have to accept it, right? It's his hometown now, and so I'm referred to him as, uh, yeah, his brother. Um, But this is what Jesus does. He breaks custom. He refers to the younger before the older, but this younger son is, is tired of living at home. He's tired of living under his father's authority. He's tired of living under the shadow of his picture-perfect, dutiful, older brother. He wants to live his own life. He wants out. But before he leaves, he needs something. Okay? He needs something. He needs his father's money. He wants his inheritance. So he does the unthinkable. He goes up to his father and he asks for his inheritance up front. And just like it would be an offense today, this was incredibly rude. It was incredibly dishonoring to his father. In Jewish custom, if a father had two sons, two-thirds of his estate would go to his first son. And then one-third of his estate would go to the second son. But all of this is supposed to be passed down after the father dies, not while he's still alive. And I want you to know that this request is more than just a rude request for money. One commentator writes this. The younger son's request shames both his family and his father. It is a certified public statement that he no longer wishes to live within or be identified by the family. In requesting what should become only available after his father's death, The son is, in effect, writing his father's death certificate. In ancient Jewish society, that was a virtually unforgivable offense. So church, in this request, the son is disowning his own father. The son is shaming his own family. But nonetheless, the father gives the son what he asks. He divides his estate and gives the younger son the money. And Jesus, when he's telling this parable, he uses an incredible wordplay to describe the younger son's heart and attitude and compare that with the father's heart and attitude. In verse 12, the younger son demands, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And the word property in the Greek is usia. And usia means physical wealth. It's a reference to physical substance. Give me the physical wealth that I have a rightful claim to. And then we are told that the father divided his property between them. But Jesus doesn't use the same word for property. He doesn't use usia to describe what he does. He uses a different word, and it's bios, bios. And in the father's response, it means that he gave him his life. Bios means life. That's why we have that word biology and that whole discipline. The father didn't just give his son physical assets. He didn't just give his son usia. He gave him his bios, his life. Then we're told that the younger son takes the money and leaves. And he doesn't just go to the next town or tribe. He goes to a far off country. This means that that he left Israel and he went into a Gentile country, a foreign land, And there he squandered his wealth in reckless living. We don't know how long his bankroll lasted or what exactly he spent his money on, right? Um, But we know that it was wasteful and we know that it didn't last. And then a famine hits the land that he was living in and the son has nothing left. He He literally went from feast to famine in a foreign land. And in verse 15, we're told that out of desperation, this younger prodigal son, he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now, that phrase, hired himself out, it means much more than just finding a job. It means much more than just finding some employment. It means to glue And to bind oneself, to join oneself to. And so Jesus' point here is not to denigrate the feeding of pigs as a lowly profession. But it's to show that this young man had not only turned his back on his father, he turned his back on his identity as an Israelite. On his faith as an Israelite. He had bound himself to another country. Bound himself to another countryman. And had become unclean. 
But even this attempt to survive wasn't enough. His hunger becomes so great that he's coveting the food that he's feeding these pigs. He was starving in this foreign land. He bound himself to this employer and yet no one was helping him. And there he comes to his senses. He comes to his senses. And, he, and his mind and heart doesn't go back to his lavish and reckless days. When his bankroll was full and he could do whatever he wants, wanted. That wasn't what he was longing for. He comes to his, his senses and he longs for home. He longs for home. He thinks about his father. He remembers his father's house. What it was like to be his son. And he remembers even the servants in my father's house. They had more than enough bread to eat. So he decides to go home. And he prepares a speech. And I'm sure we've heard this speech before. Maybe if you're a young man who got in trouble with his father, you, you, you recited and prepared something like this to try and get yourself out of trouble. And the young man prepares to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. I believe it says so much, okay, not about the contrition of the son, but it says so much about the father to think that the son didn't hesitate to believe that the father would accept him. He was sure of it. He didn't second guess the love the grace that this father would have for him. He knew he had no right to reclaim his sonship, but the prodigal knew, if I just go back home, my father will take care of me. If I just make it back home, my father will take me in. He will feed me. He will at least treat me as one of his servants. That's the kind of man his father was. And it reminds me of Romans chapter 2, verse 4, where the Apostle Paul writes that, that God's kindness leads us to repentance. God's kindness leads us to repentance. Brothers and sisters, if you didn't know by now, if you didn't sense it by now, the Father in this story represents our Father who is in heaven. And we must always remember what kind of Father He is. He is merciful, He is gracious. He is kind. Our Father in heaven is not only righteous and holy, almighty and just. You see, if we only key in on those attributes, we will know that, that we should bow before him. If we only see our Father as a holy, judging Father, then it will remind us to confess our sins. It will remind us that we are unworthy. But it's his attribute of kindness his attributes of mercy that actually compel us to go to him, that make us believe, that enables us to believe that if we go, he'll actually accept us, that he will welcome us, smelling like pigs, covered in failure, but received in love. Friends, we can repent and turn towards God because his kindness leads the way. This is our God. And this is the kind of father that we see in this story. And so this is what happens to the younger son. He makes his way back towards his father's property. But while he was still a long ways off, the father sees him. The father sees him first and he goes running towards his son. His heart was filled with compassion. His heart was filled with joy. You see, the father never stopped looking for his son. Every day he would look upon the, the edge of his property, waiting and longing to see his son return. And when he finally did, he ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son starts his speech. Before he can finish, the father calls his servants to bring the best robe to clothe him, to bring a ring to put on his finger, to put sandals on his feet. The fattened calf is killed and a celebration begins. Why? Because my son was dead, says the father, and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. You see, though the son had disowned the father, the father had never disowned his son. And there is no delay in the son's reinstatement. 
it, it, it's so immediate and it's so extraordinary. There's no probation period that the son has to go through. There's no interrogation. There's no guilt trip. The father is not passive aggressive towards his reckless and rebellious son. We see a picture of pure grace, amazing grace. The father is just lavishing the son with love. Friends, brothers and sisters, this is what happens when we repent and turn towards God. No matter how far we've fallen, regardless of how broken we are, regardless of the ways that we have rebelled against our God, regardless of the ways that we have, we have dishonored and disobeyed our perfect and loving God, the moment you and I confess our sins, the moment you and I place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God forgives us. He forgives us and he accepts us in full. Truly, our sin is great, but his grace is greater. His grace is greater. If you're watching today and you feel like a prodigal son, you feel like a prodigal daughter who's been running away from God, if you identify with this character and you've been wandering away from God's heart, wandering away from God's household, I want to encourage encourage you, finish the story of the prodigal son. Go home. Go home. May God's kindness lead you to repentance. Then the scene shifts. The scene shifts and we, we focus our attention off of the younger brother and we look now to the older brother. Let's finish our passage because we're going to see God's heart, the father's heart, towards now a self-righteous son. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Amen. The older brother is coming in from working in the field. That's what he does. That's where he goes. And as he's making his way back home, he hears music. He hears celebration, shouts and cries. He can smell the aroma of a feast. And so he asks a servant, what is going on? What is going on back at home? And the servant actually shares the father's heart. The servant actually shares the father's joy. And he replies, your brother has come and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But the older brother doesn't share the servant's enthusiasm. We see that he's angry. He's bitter and resentful. He refuses to go in. How could my father do this? After all that younger brother did, after what he did, after all the shame that he brought our family, after all the grief that he caused us, how could he throw a party for him? How could he kill the fattened calf for him, for that guy? James Edwards, in his commentary, notes, the irony of the scene is unmistakable. The offended insider is himself now a resented outsider. The older brother was an insider his entire life, and now he's on the outside. Now he's watching the celebration. He's the one refusing to go in. But when the father hears this, once again, he has an amazing heart and tenderness towards his son. He goes out and he pleads with his older son. He entreats him. 
Just as the father ran towards the younger son, the father goes out to restore his older son. And when they meet, the older son, it's now his turn to dishonor his father. He rebukes him. And he, reg- he accuses his father of being ungrateful, unjust, and naive. Okay? Ungrateful for all of the days, all of the years, he served faithfully in his father's household. Unjust because his father never even gave him a goat to celebrate amongst his friends. His father never recognized his obedience, never recognized his worth, his contributions to the family. And then naive, naive for wasting such a prized fattened calf on such a worthless, undeserving son. Dad, you're naive. Don't you realize he's devoured our property? He's dirtied our name and you are going to throw him a celebration? You are so naive. Edmund Clowney, he notes this. That bitter son is farther from home there in the field than the prodigal was in the pig pen. He has no love for his father. Keeping his father's orders is drudgery. Working for him is slavery. His real pleasure is not with his father like the prodigal at the beginning of the story. He would prefer celebrations with his own friends. He has no conception of his father's love. See, both sons are lost. Both sons had no genuine love for the father. And this older brother is now being exposed. That what he wants is a goat. What he wants is his friends. And his father never gave that to him. It's hard to see in our English translation. But there's actually a requirement in the father's response to the son. It's actually a gentle rebuke. And after he tells his son, son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. He says, it is fitting to celebrate and be glad. Okay, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. And what the text actually means, right? It's not just appropriate for us to, to party at the return of your younger brother. He's actually saying it was necessary. It is necessary to celebrate finding that which is lost. And he's actually telling his oldest son, you must celebrate with us. You must come inside. You must not remain outside in the darkness. You must not remain outside in your bitterness, in your jealousy, in your self-righteousness. If you are a part of this family, if you are a true son of mine, if you are a true older brother to the prodigal, you must come in. And celebrate. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us have been this older brother. We've played this part. Maybe you've judged your siblings, or you've judged your spouse, or your parents, or your friends. When you heard them confess a desire to walk with Jesus, when, when you've heard stories of grace and just meeting Jesus Christ and having this new passion and longing to know him and live for him, and rather than celebrate with them, rather than truly welcome them in as a spiritual family member in Christ, you're cynical towards them. You're skeptical of them. You do not welcome them in. You think, yeah, right. I know the real you. I know what you've done. I know who you are. Rather than being able to celebrate what God is doing in the present, we bring a person's past failures, a history, and we lay those things against them and say, you are not. You are not. I won't accept you. I will not celebrate with you. And this is where we need to see why. Why Jesus includes the older brother in this passage. To be honest, we, we, we could have just had the story of the younger brother, the prodigal son, and that whole welcome and that celebration. And that would have been a fantastic parable for us. A fantastic story for us. But why this, this story of the older brother? You see, Jesus is characterizing the Pharisees and the scribes as the older brother. 
These are the religious leaders in Israel, and they have observed the law to the utmost. They are considered the righteous ones in the community, but they don't share God's heart towards the lost. They don't celebrate God's mercy and grace towards sinners. And in the beginning of Luke chapter 15, we are told this is the setting, this is the context and scene for which, in which Jesus is telling his parables. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, him being Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They were judgmental of Jesus because he was fellowshipping with sinners. And their grumbling, that word is reflective of the Israelites in the wilderness. Back in the story of Exodus, when they are complaining and living in unfaithfulness towards God, they are grumbling against Moses, grumbling against God. And this is what these Pharisees and scribes are doing. They're grumbling against Jesus. And because of their grumbling, Jesus gives three parables. They're all connected. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the parable of the lost son. And this is all to expose the hearts of these religious leaders in Israel and then try to lead them towards God's heart. These are not parables of just condemnation. They're actually parables of invitation, wanting these scribes, wanting these Pharisees to join in the celebration, to join in what God and the angels and the hosts of heaven are doing every time a sinner repents and turns towards God. During the Vietnam War, there was a, an army lieutenant named Daniel Dawson whose plane was shot down in the jungle, or it went down in the jungle. And when his brother Donald, who was in America, heard the report that his brother was missing, in the jungles of Vietnam, this brother sold everything that he had. He left his wife and his three children, and he went to Vietnam looking for his brother. He went from city to city, village to village, all throughout the jungles, looking for his brother. He was imprisoned, he was tortured, and he was accused of being a spy. On multiple occasions, he almost lost his life. He became famous and well-known among the Vietnamese people as the brother of the pilot. He never found his brother, but his quest was heroic. His affection and his love and commitment to his brother, that was profound. Now, among the three parables that Jesus gives in Luke 15, with the sheep, the coin, and the son, there is notable symmetry. Something is lost, something is found. And upon finding and recovering that lost item, there's a great celebration. There's a great party. But in the parable of the prodigal son, a character is missing. Someone is missing in the third parable. You see in the first two parables, there is a seeker. A sheep is lost. A coin is lost. And so for the sheep, there is a shepherd. And the shepherd leaves the 99 to go track down and pursue and find the one. And for the lost coin, a woman ransacks her entire house looking for this one lost coin. The woman is the seeker. But in the parable of the prodigal son, no one goes out to seek out the lost son. And Jesus is intentional about this. The first thing the absence of a seeker does is expose the guilt of the older brother. The elder brother should have went out to seek his younger brother. That was his job. That should have been his mission. He should have been like Donald Dawson who left everything behind to find his brother in Vietnam. But the older brother in our story fails to do this. The older brother was more concerned with his own sense of righteousness, his own sense of responsibility. The older brother was, was proud and judgmental towards his younger brother. And he thought, if that's how he wants to live his life, he can go ahead and do that. But as for me, I'm going to stay here and do the right thing by dad. But the second thing that we see and the most important thing that this shows us, the missing, the absence of a seeker, it shows us the mission of Jesus. Remember, all of the parables are ultimately Christological. 
They show us something about Jesus. They show us something about his mission. And Jesus Christ is the good shepherd who seeks out the lost sheep. He is like the woman who up, uh, overturns her whole house, ransacks her house looking for the lost coin. And Jesus Christ is the true elder brother. He came to seek and save the lost. Jesus has been sent by our Father in heaven. He sent and he came down from heaven to earth to save us from our sins. And to Jesus, the Father can truly say, all that I have is yours. All that I have is yours. And so Jesus Christ is our true older brother. And this means such good news for us. That for you and I, when we were prodigals, or maybe you were walking like the prodigal son today, going after your own sins, living the life that you desire with no regard and no affiliation and no commitment to our Father who is in heaven, the good news is this. Jesus sees you, he loves you, and he's come for you. Okay? He has come for you. He is able to save you from the depths of whatever pit you are in right now. It, it means that, that you, you are not called to, to know and, and experience the grace of God. It's not about cleaning yourself off. It's not about preparing the right speech and fixing your life and doing whatever you think you need to do to get right with God. The good news is this, Jesus Christ has come for you. He has come to seek and save you. And he is the one who has lived the perfectly obedient and righteous life that you have failed to do. And he is the one who dies the death that you deserve on the cross. Jesus Christ has paid it all. And it is through his work and ministry as our elder brother, we get to be welcomed in as sons and daughters of God. Friends, I know that that we are haunted and burdened by our sins. Maybe through this sheltering at home season and this pandemic, you've seen more sin in your life than ever before. Maybe addictions that you thought that you'd put away, addictions that you thought that you would kick, they have flared back up. Attitudes of, of anger, of judgment, of selfishness and pride, those are flaring up in your relationships, in your marriage, in your family, and there's more conflict in your house than ever before. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you, look to Jesus Christ. Look to him. Hope in him. Believe again that he has loved you. He has pursued you and able to save you to the utmost. And I want to give an invitation to those of us who, who may be older brothers, who may be struggling with the sin of judgment, of hypocrisy, of pride and self-righteousness. If you truly are in the household of God, if you truly are a child of God, you will love the things that he loves. And you will love as he loves. Would you consider ways to to pursue others as the Father would want us to, to minister to others, to move towards others as Jesus would want us to? Would you consider ways to celebrate the work of God, not only in your life? Don't just celebrate the fact that you are reading the Bible and you are praying and you are giving and you are worshiping, but celebrate with genuine affection and joy what God is doing in other people's lives. That's what God wants in us. That's what God wants for us. To join and share and experience our Father's happiness. As he is saving many. As he is adding to his number daily. As he is expanding his kingdom and increasing his family. We are called to celebrate with him. Not to remain in pride, bitterness, and judgment. Brothers and sisters, today, regardless of who we associate ourselves as, the younger or the elder brother, our only hope and solution is Jesus Christ, our true elder brother. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel. And who are we that as rebels who run from you, as rebels who dishonor and disobey you, who are we that you would send your one and only begotten son to come after us, to save us, to love us and redeem us? Would you help us to believe in the power of your love for us? Help us to remember again that you are kind and gracious and may your kindness lead us to repentance. We thank you for this gospel story. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more.
Well, thank you so much for joining us again for worship. I pray that today and throughout this week, your hearts would be full with the love that our Father has for us that has been richly and perfectly displayed through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Would you receive the blessing of God? May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.